This week we ask, how do I know that I really am a Christian? Welcome to Harbour Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us today, whether this is your first time or whether you're a regular, you're so, so welcome. If you are new, then I'd encourage you to visit our website and you can find out how to keep connected with all that's going on in Harbour Church. Today, we're joined by guest speaker, Pastor Tom Workman from Riverview Church across in Bowness, and he's gonna help us to know what is it, how can we have certainty that we're a Christian and what does that look like? First of all, we're going to pray. And before we do, I was privileged to be in a meeting this week with Professor Jason Leach, who is the National Clinical Director. And together with a bunch of other pastors from Edinburgh and the surrounding area, we we're asking him questions about lockdown and the way that churches can begin to start to open and, and, and the sort of uh, criteria that they're using. And he, he was very candid and open with us, speaking about the nature of the, the the, the, the weight of the decisions that they're having to take. So today we're going to pray specifically about our civic leaders. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you give to men and women who govern over us and rule in both the health services and in the government and the civil service and, and the care sectors. Lord of God, I pray that you'll give them great wisdom I pray that you'll give them strength as they carry weighty decisions. And Lord, I pray that you'll give them a compassionate heart as they seek to make the right decisions. Lord, these are decisions which affect many uh, millions of people, Lord God, and we just pray that you will help them in their deliberations and, and, and their final conclusions. Lord God, we pray for all of those that are continuing to be in a lockdown situation, that are isolated or feel affected by this remoteness. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that your blessing and your goodness and your strength as well to come and your peace into each person's lives. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for our society in Musselburgh on the east coast of Scotland, and we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you may be known, that people will encounter you and come to draw strength from the one who brings hope and joy and peace and life. Lord God, we ask all of this in the amazing name that is Jesus. Amen. Uh, we'd love it if you would like uh, the video or subscribe to the channel, press the thumbs up or the subscribe button. And if you want to get alerts, then, then click the bell symbol. And that enables us to reach more people. If you'd like to give to the ongoing expenses of Harbour Church, then again, I'd encourage you to visit our website. There's a page about the giving options. Uh, the best way to give for us is to set up a standing order that enables us to plan, etc. cetera. Uh, but don't forget, if you're a taxpayer, we can claim the tax back if you gift aid everything that you give. Coming up shortly, we'll have uh, the talk from Pastor Tom with readings from uh, Lynn Gillen. Uh, but first of all, we're going to join with our friends from Soul Survivor Watford for worship. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed. Let every heart adore. Let 
Galatians 3 verses 13 to 26 You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and de devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other.
Morning Harbour Church, my name is Tom Workman. I am the lead pastor of Riverview Church just down the water in Bowness from you. And it's such a great joy to be able to share with you guys this morning. Now, in August 1997, I was 20 years old. My life was in a mess. My mind was in turmoil and I was hanging over what seemed to be like a dark, empty kind of pit. The consequences of my lifestyle and my choices were fast gaining ground on me. Now, over the previous month or so, I kept like crossing paths with these Jesus followers in all kinds of places and circumstances uh, and the one thing that I couldn't shake that they all had something oddly in common like I couldn't put my finger on it they were just different they walked differently they talked differently they acted differently they saw things differently and they were content like full of peace even happy now all of this was so alien to what I knew in my life and what I saw in myself pain and anger and resentment and lust and selfishness and loneliness and, and even fear and then late one evening, I lay on my bed, mentally wrestling with self-loathing and experiencing some kind of strange yearning that had been growing in me over that previous month to, to have what they had, or, or even more than that, to be like they, they were. I mean, was it possible? Was this Jesus character for real? And if he was, was it possible that he could change even me? And it was there into the emptiness of that room that I blurted out something like, Lord, I am tired of running from you. I've made a mess of my life. I surrender. Please, if you are real, come and help me. Come and rescue me. And I felt a kind of surge, like a warmth, almost like, you know, when you're a kid and you go to bed on Christmas Eve and you're just so pumped, you feel that excitement. You know, it was kind of like that. But but that was it. No dramatic kind of appearance, no voice, no light show or anything like that so as the feeling subsided I thought well that could have just been me I could have worked myself up into an excitement how do I know and that question then followed me into the next day. I knew something was different, but not the different that I expected. It wasn't as obvious or definitive as I wanted it to be. Now, sure, as I went to work, I realised that my language had changed a little bit. I was a chef, by the way, and that the way that I viewed my female colleagues had also changed. But like that kind of sensation, that feeling I had the night before, I kind of put all of that down to just this idea of me desperately trying a last ditch attempt attempt to change myself and be something different. I'm not sure what I was really expecting right there, but I didn't feel like a Christian. How, how do I know that this is for real, that I am a Christian, that I am saved, that, that Jesus now lives his life through me by his Holy Spirit? I mean, have you ever asked yourself that question? I mean, new believers and seasoned disciples alike at some point, all possibly at many points, ask that question. How do I know that I'm a real Christian, that I'm genuine, not faking it, that I am saved and that all of this is for real? Well, there are a few ways that we could answer that question, a few different places where we could find assurance and reassurance. But today I really want to zone in, focus in on one area, and that is that there is evidence within us of his life in you and in me. So how do I know, how do you know that he is living his life in and through you and in and through me. Well, today I want to give you briefly two evidences for that, two cautions as well, and then two encouragements as we come to wrap up. So the two evidences of his life at work in you and at me are firstly, because what we desire slowly changes. And then secondly, because how we behave slowly changes. This is all from that passage that we've just read. So let's look firstly at what we desire and how how that slowly changes when he lives his life in and through us. And Paul says, as we've just read, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He also goes on to say that those desires are in conflict with each other. They literally pull away from each other. So really, it's like this. The more we're led by the spirit, the less we are drawn to the flesh. But on the flip side of that, the more we gratify our flesh, the further away we move from a healthy relationship with Father God. 
Now, honestly, I get this wrong, you get this wrong, we get this wrong, right? That the flesh has a strong magnetic field because it's enjoyable, because it's instantly satisfying. But honestly, don't we know that it's lastingly disappointing or, or worse, that it's long term destructive? I, th I think we do know this, and yet we're still so powerfully drawn to what the flesh seems to put on offer. These two polar opposites of spirit and flesh are at war with each other. They, they really are. Uh, and even Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrestled with this in Romans 7, saying, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I hate, I do. In, in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but there's another force at work in me and the two are at war but the thing is our desire is shifting slowly but surely even as we still wrestle with it we want to pursue God we want to walk by the spirit and keep in step you know desire is always the first indicator or evidence but but also following on from that we have a second evidence which is because how we behave also slowly changes now, Paul lists some examples of, of flesh behaviours, you know, things that we were into before, a, a low view of sex and sexuality, or too high a view of, of things that we often elevate above God or put before God, and then all kinds of excesses and indulgences in between. Now, surely these are things that we all can identify at some points in our own history. You know, characteristics that are incompatible with what he reveals to be the fruit of the spirit. That is the, the glory and the perfection of who he is and what he is growing in us. That's the fruit of the spirit. Love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. The fruit of the Holy Spirit growing within us. Now notice that Paul points out of the fruit that however much it increases, it is always good. It doesn't increase to a point where it turns negative. It is always good and it just gets better and better. He says against such things there is no law. So at the absolute extremity of the fruit of the spirit it just gets better. Whereas the acts of the flesh, however harmless we say they might be, argue what they might be or think they may be in their kind of conception, all of them will land you in trouble, in destruction, in prison even, and ultimately will lead you to death. As they grow, they become more ferocious in devouring your life. The, the behaviour of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit are complete opposites. Like north from south, like hot from cold, like light from darkness. So as we face Christ, so this fruit grows within us and we move increasingly toward him and away from what lay before. Our shifting behaviour is evidence of his life in us, even as we still kind of wrestle like slowly but surely we want to pursue God, we want to walk by the Holy Spirit, and we want to see his fruit growing in our lives. Now, as we move forward, I just want to highlight two cautions here. And the first caution is this, that this isn't a checklist that we have to adhere to. And then the second caution is that neither is this an exemption for us from personal responsibility. Let's deal with that checklist kind of image first. It's actually unhelpful to see the list that Paul puts in there as kind of like checklist, something that you have to work towards to do in order to gain the Spirit's approval or God's acceptance, like by achieving godliness and righteousness for ourselves. I mean, it might be like saying this year, I know that I've got to deal with my, my jealousy issue and perhaps I should try working on my love and my gentleness in order to be a better Christian, to be a good Christian. I mean, it would actually be a tragic mistake to see this passage in that kind of way. Why? 
Well, that would lead us away from him and not to him because it makes it about us. It makes it about look at me like that Pharisee in Luke 18 who looks at a tax collector next to him and then says, thank you, God, that I'm a righteous and holy person, not like that pitiful sinner there. You know, what we've read today in Galatians is an excerpt from a letter from Paul to the people of that church in Galatia. And the whole point of that letter was that there were some people who were like desperately trying to enforce the law in order to be religiously acceptable and made righteous, at least in in man's eyes. You know, Paul wants to reinforce that we are not under the law but set free by grace through faith to to be set free not captive to the flesh but alive to the spirit no longer slaves to sin but now sons of his righteousness and Paul's whole argument is that that religious and legalistic observance of the law cannot save us we can't do it Honestly, left to ourselves, left to our own devices equals flesh and all that comes from that. So any religion that we have that comes out of that is going to be idolatry. Only faith in Christ Jesus can save. Only throwing ourselves at his mercy and grace, allowing him to transform us. It's not a self-improvement checklist. But then the second caution is also, it's not a checklist, but it's also not an exemption. We, we can't simply just sit back, enjoy the ride, do as we please and trust that fruit will grow. There is an expectation upon us as well. We have freedom, but Paul strongly urges us not to use that freedom to indulge ourselves, to indulge the desires of our flesh. And that's why Paul presents the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit together, because right Right now, there are opposite ends of the room and you are heading towards one of them. Which one would that be? They can't coexist along the same route. At every moment in your life, you are drawing nearer to one and further away from the other. And that is why James says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. To submit to God is to draw near to him and at the same time it is to resist and move away from the devil. So that we're talking about, it's not checklists, but neither is it something that we don't have any responsibility or involvement in. These changes, these evidences that I mentioned are natural occurrences, the result of a life submitted to him and a result of his life therefore from that submission within us. Something is growing in us, being cultivated in us and as a result we are moving towards this and away from this and that is called sanctification. Like we can act out of the flesh or we can grow up in the spirit but we can't do both at the same time. Which direction, I ask you gently, which direction are you headed in? And and be encouraged, we all struggle with this, right? I mean, all get frustrated with ourselves and question our own progress, I'm sure. So here come two encouragements briefly. And the first encouragement is that this is a continuous ongoing process. And the second one is that it's a slow process as well. So, you know, ease up on yourself. So firstly, it's a continuous process, not like a done deal, not like you get saved and everything's changed in that moment. Now, I've said that evidence that he is living his life in and through us by his Holy Spirit is that something different is growing in us. Our, our desire and our behaviours are changing. But did you get the present tense that I used there? Growing. Like we are made to be new creations at the same time as being transformed by the renewing of our minds more and more into his image. The fruit of his spirit, the character of Christ is growing in you. And that's encouraging because he started something in you. He is still doing something in you. And he promises that he will finish that thing that he started doing in you. 
So things are changing, right? I mean, somewhere inside of us, in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our actions, and in our character, slowly but surely, things are being transformed. What we desire and how we behave, slowly but surely changing. And, and as we move from being led by the flesh to being led by his spirit. Well, that's great, isn't it? Honestly, that's amazing. But the problem is that at any time we can look at ourselves or worse at somebody else and we can see reason for disappointment and discouragement. Like I'm still struggling with this or I'm still angry or I'm still resentful or I'm I'm still attracted to the wrong things. How am I going to get through this? How, How do you know in all of that at that moment that he is living his life in you and through you? Well, Notice in those two evidences, I used the word, I've used it repeatedly, slowly. It's a slow process. You know, the day after the night before, when I first lay on my bed and was asking that question, how do I know? Oddly, I was convinced that Jesus was real. And so I rationalised that next morning that perhaps I wasn't good enough for him or perhaps I wasn't ready yet. You know, the funny thing was, though, that friends and family noticed Whether believers or non-believers, there was a difference and everybody else noticed it. Believers saw life in me and they rejoiced. Non-believers saw something that probably made them quite uncomfortable and so they mocked me. But actually both reacted, both saw something immediately different and that helped to convince me of that real change. It, It was then immediately clear that things were different and genuine. But That was one of the very few times that I have been able to see like perceptibly and immediately a difference within myself. Most of the time, honestly, we don't see the ways God is transforming us in the moment. It's a bit like looking in the mirror. I look in the mirror every day. Most days I don't see the changes, though at times I might spot a new grey or a new line on my face. But the reality is those things aren't new. They've just come to my attention at that point in time. Uh, And yet, if I look at a picture of myself from the 90s, well, then definitely I can see a difference in how I look now and how I look then. Now, the same is true spiritually. If I take Galatians 5 as a list of expectations, and if I search myself in that spiritual mirror each day, I will not notice a discernible change daily in me. But I might on occasion recognise something different, like how I handle that situation or whatever. But when I look back, When I consider how I've changed or rather been changed over the past 20 years, well, then I can see something clearly different, something of his evidence of his life at work in me. It's a slow process and it seems slower uh, sometimes for some than other people. But the truth is, it is a lifetime of his work in all of us all of the time. And the best news is he is faithful to finish what he started. So the next time you look in that spiritual mirror and berate yourself for not being further on, higher up, holier, better. Just remember, you're not likely to see it in that moment. And that's a good thing because it means it's harder to be proud about it. But be assured, he is doing it in you and you can look back and see how far he has taken you. Now, as I wrap up, the flesh and the spirit, they are in opposite directions. Which direction are you headed in? Or or even which direction do you desire to be heading in. We may all struggle, will struggle in fact, but we we can choose the direction in which our head is turned and that will determine the direction in which we travel. The more we draw near to God, the more able we are to resist the pull of the flesh and of the enemy. So how do I know Because my desires and my behaviours have been slowly changing, like moving in a new direction. I encourage you, continue to choose to walk the Spirit's road. Submit to God and the fruit of the Spirit will grow in you and will be growing in your life. And that is evidence by which you can know that he is living his life in and through you. Amen. I love you, Lord, oh, your mercy never fails me, in all my days I've been held in your hands, from the moment that I wake up, until
Fall. 